On this episode of Cycle Talk, we ride the Triumph Thunderbird Storm, the big dark British performance cruiser, Yamaha's Tricity three-wheel scooter, Suzuki's RE5 Rotary is our classic this week, we fit a two brothers system to our FZ6, and to start the show, we've been out touring on the Indian Roadmaster. If you're after full dress American luxury, from the stereo to cruise control, to heated grips and seats, to the capacity to take two people with lots of luggage on tour, you really need to check out the new boy on the block, the Indian Roadmaster. The Roadmaster really makes a statement. This is about as big as a bike you can get. It really is a very, very big motorcycle, over 400 kilograms, which makes it really surprising that a bike that's making such a bold statement on the road is actually so easy to ride. And I think that comes down to the aluminium chassis, good quality suspension, fairly low seat, and very low center of gravity. It's almost hard to think of a feature this bike doesn't have. It's got a great stereo. It's got fog lights. It's got great weather protection. It's got vents in the, in the lowers here so you can open them up and get some airflow through in warmer weather. It's got central locking. It's got a remote ignition. It really does have pretty well everything that you need as a, on a standard big touring bike. And Indian's offering options for a few other bits and pieces if there's something else in particular that you do really want. The Roadmaster is a real statement bike from, from Indian. I mean, look at the style, very American. Influenced probably by American muscle cars. The big twin exhaust from the big V-twin engine. The, the touches of, of style that almost come out of the 50s. In fact, I reckon you could actually convince people that this bike is actually a restored 1968 model. Which is actually pretty funny for people in the know because there were no Indians manufactured in 1968 at all. But I still reckon you could convince a few people. So the Roadmaster, it's a big bike with lots of adjustments on it. So you can set it up to be just the way you want it. You can adjust the screen, screen height. You, the pillion floorboards can be adjusted for height so that it doesn't matter whether you have a tall pillion passenger or a short pillion passenger. The shock is pneumatically adjustable, so you can set that up the way you like it. Then, of course, you can have the stereo playing the music or the information you want. You've got a, a particular pocket designed for your mobile phone, so you can plug that in, get the information and the music off your phone. There's power, there's lots and lots of ways to make this machine just so comfortable on those long distance rides. Now it might look like it's come from 1968, but the reality is this is a very, very modern motorcycle. The Thunderstroke 1811cc engine or well, Thunderstroke 111, which is the capacity in cubic inches, has heaps and heaps of torque. So it's got plenty of grunt, combined with a six-speed gearbox, means you can get away from the traffic lights as quick as you want. You can also cruise on whatever speed you like, and the cruise control is faultless. It just sits you on the freeway and you just eat the miles. Stopping the machine is a pair of 300mm floating discs at the front with four piston calipers and a 300mm floating disc at the rear with a twin piston caliper. It's ABS right across the board and the brakes work really, really well. In fact, I think part of the reason this bike gives you so much confidence is those brakes are nice and easy to use and combined with the low seat and the low centre of gravity, it does make throwing U-turns and just manoeuvring the bike really, really easy. When it's stopped and you're trying to manoeuvre it, sometimes it'd be nice to have reverse gear, especially if you're a bit shorter in the leg. I'd like to just load it up, grab the missus, and hit the road for a couple of weeks. It'd be a lot of fun. This machine handles better than the vast majority of bikes of this size. 
Uh, it's really enjoyable in the corners. The suspension, the pneumatic suspension on the back especially, soaks up the bumps so well. The seat is magnificent. It's so comfortable, it's, it's amazing. Cruise control, you know, nice low revving V-twin engine, six-speed gearbox, full electronics. There's really, really very little to criticise about this machine at all. And it just makes for touring a lot of fun. I wish I didn't have to take it back. It's available in three different colour screens. You've got this Indian red, you've got a black one, and you've got this red with the Indian cream colour two-tone, which actually looks really, really special. So what we've got here is a really good American-style touring bike. It's big, it's heavy, it's expensive at $38,995 right away, but there's a lot of bike, a lot of electronics, a lot of comfort, a lot of convenience, and I don't think there'd be very many people who'd ride one of these and think it wasn't a whole heap of fun. Everybody knows that a heavyweight cruiser has a big, fat rear tyre, belt drive, raked out front end, forward controls, and a big stonking V-twin motor. Actually, not all. This is the Thunderbird from Triumph, and it's got the world's biggest parallel twin fitted to a motorcycle at 1,700 cc's. The colour matches the name, the Storm, and it goes like a Storm too. Heaps and heaps of grunt, lots and lots of fun. You've got to check out one of these things if you're into performance cruisers. Although on paper there's only 100 horsepower, there's 115 metres of torque, and it's produced at under 3,000 RPM. So even in the higher gears, even at low speed, you crack the throttle on this, it makes a beautiful noise with these aftermarket Triumph pipes, and it takes off. So it really is a performance cruiser. But it's got all those lovely things about cruising motorcycles that, that you don't get on, on sportier bikes, like a big, wide, comfortable seat that's really, really low, so you can get your feet to the ground really easy. The forward controls, aren't too far forward, so they're not way out there near the front axle. They're in a good position. And these pullback handlebars, I think, are just about perfect. They come back, give you a great riding position without putting too much strain. Now, that all combines to mean that on freeways, you don't want to go a lot faster than the speed limit because you will start to find that that wind will start to blow you backwards, but that's okay. This is about having a lot of fun getting to that highway limit rather than doing massive amounts over it. The engine's a perler, lumpy, thumpy and grunty. You take off in the traffic lights, you could lose a passenger and you might not even notice. Now there's a few other things that are really nice about this motorcycle. The paint is just spectacular, it looks really good. The instruments, well they're housed inside the tank here. There's quite a lot of information in this one big dial, including a taco down the bottom and an LCD panel to give you lots of other information. Up the back here, the rider's seat's really good. If you're really after something to carry a pillion passenger a lot, you might have to dive into the Triumph accessory catalogue or have a good look at the LT model, which is for light touring, and it's got a much better pillion passenger seat on it. Up front, there's a 19-inch front wheel. Now, on that 19-inch front wheel is two big discs, ABS equipped, four piston calipers. This thing stops really, really well. It's one of the best set of brakes ever on a big cruiser. And you need it too, because the bike encourages it to ride a little bit faster than most cruisers would. Handling is also pretty good. Generally speaking, you, you've got nothing really to complain about. It goes around corners quite well. And scraping the foot pegs, well, that's just part of the fun. The only thing about that I'm a bit disappointed in is that rear suspension is a little bit underdamped. You could fix that if you wanted to with another set of shocks. So overall, this bike works really well and I'm really happy with the performance and handling of the Thunderbird Storm. I think Triumph have done a great job on this bike of getting the styling right. The way this guard is, it's, it's big and it's traditional, but it's not over the top. It flows really well into the styling of the, of the tank, and then the side cover, and then that rear mud guard. They all work really well together, and you can tune them up a little bit if you want to change the styling a little bit with a trip through the Triumph accessory catalogue. So the Thunderbird Storm will stand up against any big V-twin. It's also a great value at $20,990 and you can currently get a $500 discount at Triumph Dealers and they're also throwing in a year's comprehensive insurance.
You can win an awesome Contour Rome 3 action camera with Cycle Talk and Contour. Just go to cycletalk.com.au slash contour to enter and sign up for the Cycle Talk email newsletter while you're there. The Contour cameras will be won every week and we'll announce the winner on next week's show. Stop dreaming and start riding. Your motorcycle adventures start with Triumph at Pro Cycles. Get the best of British on the classic Bonville or Thruxton. Tame a tiger in the bush or take the dirt road on an Explorer. Go touring in comfort on a trophy. Cruise without limits on a Thunderbird. Add some thrills on a Daytona or Speed Triple. Make it happen at Pro Cycles. Hornsby on Sydney's north side and St Peter's in the south. Previously we looked at the Norton Classic and now we're going to take a look at Suzuki's RE5. Probably the most recognisable rotary powered motorcycle. Now back in the 70s Suzuki spent a massive amount of money developing this bike and when you look at the, the name RE5, the 5 apparently stands for the fifth variant of the engine rather than 500cc. Now, very technically complex and in 1974, when this bike was released to Joe Public, they used Edgar Mitchell. He's an astronaut, American astronaut. He was the sixth man to land on the moon, and they used him widely to release this bike. And that's pretty fitting, really, because it is very jet age inspired. Now being quite a complex motorcycle, that complexity also added weight. And with half a tank of fuel, this bike weighs over 250 kilos. But you could take that even further by buying one of the factory touring kits, which got you a fairing, a top box, and panniers. As you can see, the engine is quite a part of the styling of this bike, but Suzuki outsourced the styling of the rest of the machine to an Italian design house. And the early models had some very, very trick things that set it apart from the competition. Things like the instrument cluster, which when you turn the ignition on, a whole panel would revolve open and show you what you needed to see. Now Suzuki had so much invested in this bike and they wanted it to succeed so much, they offered the most comprehensive warranty at the time. In the first 12 months from brand new, if you had an engine problem with a bike, they would replace the complete engine. But you know, the biggest competition of the RE5 came from Suzuki's own catalog. Why buy this bike when sitting beside it in the showroom was the GT750? It was cheaper, it was faster, and it handled better. Now, Suzuki's RE5 only lasted three years, and you'd have to say it was a financial disaster for Suzuki. And I think the lessons of pursuing outlandish designs are probably still being taught at Suzuki to this day. I 
said earlier that the Suzuki GT750, this bike's own stable, mate, probably killed its sales, and that's a real shame, because I think if people had have taken the time to think outside the box and ride this bike, that might have been swayed to pay the extra money. This bike, the owner Kim, he spends more time riding it than polishing it, and it's a good mechanical example. And it does ride very nice. Bit of a gentleman's express, it's heavy, it's got a long wheelbase, but it does ride very nicely. The power is quite good, it's got lots of torque, and I think it's a real shame that people maybe didn't go that extra mile back in the mid 70s. Small capacity scooters have lots of storage capacity, step through design, good weather protection, and a small wheel at each end. Well, they used to. This is the Yamaha Tricity, or Tricity if you prefer, and it has two front wheels for extra stability, better control, and much better performance under brakes. Along with that comes a 125cc four-stroke single engine and a whole package weighs in at only 150 kilos. So it's barely heavier than you'd expect out of a 125cc scooter as well. And yet it adds up to giving the rider of the Tricity more confidence in more weather conditions and hopefully will attract people who wouldn't normally look at a scooter for transport to be attracted to this type of way to get to work. Piaggio's had its MP3 range of three -wheel, leaning three-wheelers for the best part of a decade, but they're far more expensive machines. This one, $4,995 right away, is the first bike we'd call as an economic scooter with this design. Now, in a lot of conventional scooters, they're very back heavy. The engine is basically over the back wheel and the front ends are very, very light. So having the double front wheel has allowed Yamaha to build this machine with a 50-50 weight bias front and back. So after that initial getting used to that feeling, this bike actually handles much better than many 125cc scooters. Now there's some things that a modern scooter should have. One of them is a hook at the front here, which if my wife rode this scooter, she'd use for her handbag. I like using them for takeaway food. The takeaway bag goes over the hook really well. And also, the flick of the key, you can pop the seat up and spot in here big enough to take a full face helmet, let alone an open face like this one. And the filler cap for the fuel is there as well. So to the experienced rider, this bike does feel a little bit different when you first jump on it. But really, after about a half a dozen corners, you really start to understand that there's a lot more contact patch with the two front wheels, and therefore you can actually tip it in pretty hard if you want to. That's not really what it's designed for. It's designed to give people who don't ride more confidence in that front end and know that even in the wet, it's really, really unlikely that it's going to slide out from underneath you. And also, a lot more braking power, so you can jump on the brakes really hard and it just slows you down. Now, performance is moderate. It'll get away from the traffic lights quicker than most cars will, and it'll accelerate up to that 80 or 90 kilometres an hour reasonably quickly. Beyond that, and up to the speed limits on freeways of 100, 110, it's, uh, it gets there, but there's not much left for overtaking. So. If you're going to spend a lot of time on a freeway, you might want to look at the Yamaha T-Max instead. So for the Tricity, it's a city bike. It's best off where the speed limits are a bit lower, where you can get through the traffic, you can lane split with ease, and parking, it's just a breeze. So to sum up the Tricity, it's a machine that offers good versatility in its ease of use. It'll carry two people, carries a load. It's very easy to ride and that third wheel gives it that extra confidence, that extra security on the road, uh, especially in the rain, and especially if you have to jump on the brakes. So for, from a safety point of view, it's probably a step up above every other 125cc scooter out there. It's also got cap price servicing. So the $4,995 price and the cap price servicing means you're not gonna get hit up. It's gonna be a cheap way to get to work. And I think any car drivers that with have been put off scooters in the past because of the perceptions of safety, performance, whatever, should have a go on the Tricity. I think they'll be really surprised at how versatile, how much fun it is, and how much time and money you could save using one of these to get to work. If you've got friends that have been thinking about getting a scooter, make sure you point out that this machine, it's new, it's a little bit different, and it's well worth a look.
their pants on one leg at a time. What separates some of us, though, is what we throw a leg over after our pants are on. The new Harley-Davidson Breakout Motorcycle. Breakout. For the April edition, we went to the world launch of the Yamaha YZF R1 and R1M. From one of the hottest sports bikes around, we then tested the Triumph Tiger 800 XCX, one of the most innovative and newest adventure bikes. We've also been off to Thailand to check the KTM Duke range out and jumped on one of the most exciting new touring bikes, the Victory Magnum. Also featuring in the April edition is Sultans of Slide. Then there's our regular columns, there's lots of news, there's books for sale and lots and lots more. Cycle Talk magazine is free at better bike shops right around Australia or download your copy. More info, cycletalk.com.au Fearless innovation starts with an attitude. While others claim to be ahead of the curve, we're already leaning into the next one. We're about setting the precedent year after year and letting the rest play catch up. They ride to keep up with today. We ride to own tomorrow. This week's winner of the Contour Rome 3 action camera is Peter McPherson from New South Wales. There's still lots more Contour Rome 3 cameras to win. Go to cycletalk.com.au slash contour for your chance. <laughs> Most motorcycles these days sound okay when you get them off the showroom floor, but the addition of a better pipe makes them sound better, often perform better, and they also make the whole bike a little bit lighter. So they're often a 
first thing you do when you want a little bit more performance and a little bit more style. So we're going to do that to this FZ6 today. The standard pipe, as you can see down there, it's a shorty muffler. And so we've got here a Two Brothers full system, with, still with a shorty muffler, but it doesn't have the big collector box. It'll be a lot lighter and it'll sound a lot better. So this is what the standard system sounds like. And now the Two Brothers system for the FZ6. So it's taken me a couple of hours to fit the full system to the FZ6. So a system from Two Brothers Racing and a mechanic could probably do it a little quicker than me. I'm certainly not a mechanic. If you're comfortable with the tools, it's not a difficult job. If, you, if you're not comfortable spinning spanners, get a mechanic to fit up a new exhaust system to your machine. Now, Two Brothers make a variety of full systems and slip-on mufflers, depending on the bike. So the options available to you will depend on what your bike is. Now, on the FZ6, we've saved four kilos. Quite a lot of weight saving. The standard system, eight kilos, and the Two Brothers system, four kilos. So we've already made a big benefit in the appearance and in the weight. Now, let's have a listen. I think you'll agree, it's an awful lot better sounding machine now with the Two Brothers system on it.